Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Wildfire Smoke in Your House, presented in partnership with Fire Smart Canada and the BC Centre for Disease Control. Thank you so much for joining us. This session is part of Prepared Together, Canadian Red Cross Disaster Preparedness Virtual Learning Series. This session today is presented in English. The spring and summer of 2024 are predicted to bring an unprecedented level of intensity for emergencies across the country. The goal of this learning series is to support people and communities to prepare for, increase their resilience to, and respond to future disasters. We are hosting learning sessions throughout the summer in both English and French. You can use the QR code on your screen to visit our website to learn about and register for our other programming. We will also post the web pages for you in the chat. And just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Today's webinar will be recorded and recordings will be sent to all registrants. Closed captioning is available in both English and French. Just click the closed captioning button in your Zoom control panel. At the end of today's session, we will have a Q&A period. Please leave your questions in the Q&A box in the control panel at the bottom of your screen. There will be a feedback survey that launches on your browser once you exit today's webinar. We really appreciate your input on how we did today. Resource packages from all of our sessions will also be on the CRC website this summer. And if you have any questions about today's programming, you can email us at rrr at redcross.ca. And we acknowledge that much of our work in Canada is on the traditional treaty and unceded territories, home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Each of us resides on the traditional land of the First Peoples of Turtle Island. Let's take a moment to acknowledge the shared history of Indigenous peoples and settlers in this land with the goal of reconciliation. Please take a moment and share in the Zoom chat where you are from or live today. Moments like this allow us to connect in the spirit of collaboration, friendship, and reconciliation to value the ways of being, knowing, and learning of all Indigenous peoples and nations across Turtle Island. So in the webinar chat, please tell us where you are joining us from today. And the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies has seen fundamental principles, which we also honor in Canada. Interestingly, these principles align with Indigenous peoples of Canada's seven sacred teachings. Where I reside on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe peoples, these are also known as the grandfather teachings of wisdom, love, respect, bravery, honesty, humility, and truth. And without further ado, I would now like to introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Henderson, Scientific Director of Environmental Health Services at BC Centre for Disease Control and Maria Sharp, Fire Science Manager from Fire Smart Canada. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you, April. And you can hear me okay? Perfect. Um, my name is Maria Sharp. I am with, joining you uh, from the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre and representing Fire Smart Canada. Joining you today from Treaty 6 Territory near uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Fire Smart Canada is a national program that helps Canadians increase resilience to wildfire and minimize its negative impacts. It was founded in 1993 to address common concerns about wildfire in the wildland urban interface. Today, FireSmart Canada supports the development of tools to reduce wildland fire risk with a renewed focus on building partnerships and a program that reaches people where they live. More so now than ever, Canadians are feeling the direct and indirect impacts of wildfire. There is a growing need for FireSmart education and we have an incredible website that I'll pop in the chat that can help connect you to resources and links to local FireSmart information, depending on where you live in, in Canada or if we have anyone from outside of Canada as well. While FireSmart Canada has a long history in Canada, it's recently been tasked with developing tools to address smoke and health concerns for people, communities, and first responders. We have a lot of work to do and so much to learn, and it all starts with education. Um, we are so pleased, FireSmart Canada is so pleased to be partnering with Red Cross today to provide a space to learn about the short and long-term health effects of wildfire smoke and how to effectively protect yourself, your family, and your community. 
I can't think of anyone more knowledgeable in this area than Dr. Sarah Henderson, who's agreed to join us here today, and we're really excited about that. But Dr. Henderson is the Scientific Director of Environmental Health Services at the BC Centre for Disease Control and the Scientific Director of the National Collaborating Centre for Environmental Health. She is also a professor at the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Henderson oversees a broad program of applied research, surveillance, and knowledge translation to support evidence-based environmental health policy and practice in BC and across Canada. She has been studying the population health effects of wildfire smoke for more than 20 years. Welcome, Dr. Henderson. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me. I'm guessing that my sound is working okay because I started out on mute. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go ahead here and share my slides. And can I get confirmation that everybody can see those okay? Perfect. Thank you very much. So it's a real pleasure to be here today with you through, you know, the weekend coming into what can be the most severe part of the wildfire season in BC and Western Canada. So it's a good time to be having this conversation. And, you know, I think we do expect more wildfire activity, especially in Western Canada in the weeks ahead, given the hot, dry weather that we've been having. So very happy to be having this opportunity to speak with you about wildfire smoke and its health effects. I'm joining you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tooth First Nations, um, and the traditionally, traditionally Hulkamalem speaking people. And whenever I talk about wildfires and wildfire smoke, I do like to emphasize the fact that the Indigenous people of Canada are very disproportionately affected by wildfires and smoke and these hazards and other climate hazards as well. I put a link in the chat to a recent paper by Amy Cardinal Christensen, who's one of the leading Indigenous wildfire scholars in Canada. And it really highlights how disproportionately affected Indigenous populations are with respect to wildfire evacuations in Canada. So if you're interested in this topic, I highly recommend a review of that paper. There is a lot of great information in there. So we've got some polling questions today. I'm going to go ahead and launch this first question for you to answer. The 2023 wildfire season was the most severe recorded in Canadian history. Do you believe there will be another season even more severe in the next 10 years? And I think we got about 30 folks online here. So, oh, I see there's 23 who are able to participate. I'll wait until we have most of the responses in place and then I will share them with you. Looks like we are converging on an answer here. I'll share those results with you. Uh, the vast majority of respondents felt yes with some no and some maybe. I'm going to save further conversation about this until the very end of the presentation. Um, and you might need to click the X on your window there to get that, that result to go away so that you can continue to see the slides in the presentation. So for, if you're, for those of you who haven't seen it, I don't believe this paper has been peer reviewed yet, but it is um, online and available. This is uh, Pius Jane and, and uh, you know, all of the top fire scientists in Canada taking a look at the 2023 wildfire season. It's a big paper, but it's very, very worth reading because it highlights how incredibly different this season was from anything we'd seen previously. This plot or this map shows different regions of Canada in different colors and then these bars are colored according to those regions. And one of the really interesting things about this season was that it was the worst season everywhere. Typically in Canada, we have a bad season in the east or a bad season in the north or a bad season in the west. 2023 was a bad season 
throughout the country. And you can see, looking over this record of several decades, just how outstanding it was compared with what we'd seen previously. The other side of that fire activity, of course, is the total carbon emissions that came with it. And this is another plot that so clearly demonstrates how outstanding this season was. So these are the seasons of the past 20 years. Each dashed line is one of the years and the black line is the mean across all of the years. And this is 2003. It started relatively early and it kept going and going and going and going and going. And even when we hit here in September, this is actually the steepest part of this whole line. So this wildfire season started early it never stopped and, you know, went late into what we would consider wildfire season in Canada. Again, simply unprecedented. So far this year, in 2024, we look much more normal, although the emissions in Alberta and BC are quite similar to their 2023 emissions. Now, just to a note on wildfire smoke and kind of how it moves. A big wildfire creates very hot smoke and that smoke is going to loft well up into the atmosphere. Here you can see that the smoke is not hot enough to be punching through the atmospheric boundary layer, but when there is very hot smoke, you will see that smoke punch through and move into the upper parts of the atmosphere. But it's coming up, it's getting trapped by the boundary layer, and then it's spreading out. The way things are in this plot, there probably aren't very high air quality impacts in this area over here. There's obviously, oops, sorry, that's just uh, me going. Oh, gosh. You can't. OK, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, there probably aren't very high air quality impacts here. There will be high air quality impacts here. But this smoke is going to travel and travel and travel. And then as it cools down and goes through a bunch of atmospheric chemical changes, it's going to settle in other places. And that's why we see very high air quality impacts of smoke from distant fires in some cases. And 2023 was an excellent example of this. You know, there were huge air quality impacts uh, from Canadian fires on the U.S. eastern seaboard, and that got a lot of attention. More and more, you're going to see conversations about smoke in weather forecasts, and that's exactly what we need. Smoke is a type of weather. We do need to communicate with people about it, like we communicate about rain and sun and UV index. It's all part of the ambient environment that people are going to be exposed to. And here you can see this clip from a newscast last year showing that smoke coming from Canadian fires down through Toronto, down through New York. The fires are quite distant from these places, but the air quality impacts in some of these large cities are huge. And just a, a, a picture I really like because these kinds of events get a lot of media attention. People really pay attention to wildfire smoke when it's starting to affect air quality in highly populated cities like New York, where there's you know, 25 million people living. And while it can be frustrating that smoke only seems to get attention when there are these kinds of air quality impacts, they really can drive the conversation and the funding related to wildfire smoke. So they, they can be really useful to capitalize on in, in the time after they occur. So the next question for me to share with you, I will get this launched. Sorry, I'm just having a bit of a, 
I don't want to launch that poll. I want to launch another poll. Oh, back. There we go. Um, launching this one. Wildfire smoke. No. I'm so sorry. I'm ending that one. I'm going back. Here we go. How is exposure to wildfire smoke most different from exposure to other types of air pollution, such as vehicle exhaust or industrial emissions? Is it more spatially unpredictable, more temporally unpredictable, bigger air quality impacts? We have no ability to regulate it or all of the above. All right, we are at 20 answers here. So I'll end that poll and I'll share those results. Most of you went with all of the above and that is the correct answer from my perspective. And we'll talk about this a little more in the next few slides. So, Air pollution from more conventional sources, such as industry and traffic, is pretty spatially constrained and pretty consistent. Uh, an industrial complex emits a pretty steady amount of air pollution unless something has gone wrong all of the time, and it's always in the same spot. The thing that really drives its air quality impacts is the weather. Um, Similarly, cars are always on the road. An individual car has a pretty steady amount of pollution. And the thing that drives the air quality impacts of traffic is mostly the weather. Now, we have decades of research showing that air pollution from these sources is harmful to human health. And it's harmful to human health in almost every way that we look at potential harm. It's not just respiratory health, it's cardiovascular health, it's brain health, it's skin health, it's eye health. Every single organ system in the body is affected by air pollution. And those decades of research have really motivated regulation from these types of sources that we are able to regulate. The air quality situation now in 2024 is vastly different than it was in 1984, largely because of that scientific evidence. Wildfires are a totally different beast. The air quality impacts are highly spatially variable, they are highly temporally variable. You may have two terrible years and then three fine years. They are totally unregulatable. We may be able to make some changes that help us to reduce some of the air quality impacts. And then the degree of impact is totally different. It's off the scale in North America compared with the air quality impacts we would see from those other uh, more conventional sources. And I just want to walk you through a little bit of this using some data from two locations in BC that I have circled here. One is Prince George, which is pretty much in the middle of the province and very centrally located with respect to wildfire activity in the province. And the other is Greater Vancouver, which has the largest population in the province, but is generally relatively far removed from actual wildfires. So these are the data for five years in Prince George. To 2016 and 2019 were very low, below average wildfire years. They are the red and purple lines. And if you look down here, you can see they kind of track along the bottom. 2017 and 2018 were the most extreme seasons on record until 2023 came along. And then 2020 was not a bad wildfire year in BC, but it was a bad wildfire year in the US. And we did get some smoke coming up from those fires. And I just want to show you how highly variable this is from year to year. And this is important when it comes to the differences between wildfire smoke and other types of air pollution, because when we have those more steady sources, 
the air pollution, you know, goes up and down a little bit on a daily basis, but it's pretty steady over time. And therefore, that evidence that's been generated based on air pollution from those sources kind of reflects a long-term exposure. With wildfire smoke, there are places that get exposed pretty regularly, but even if they get exposed pretty regularly, like Prince George, there's still these long periods where there aren't high exposures, even within season and across seasons. And that ability for the body to recover from those high exposures might mean something in terms of the longer term health impacts of these exposures. And just as a comparison, here's Vancouver over the same years. You can see that the smoke impacts are much, much lower in this region, although that impact from the um, smoke from the U.S. in 2020 was a little bit higher because it was more close. And overall, the message I want to convey, and these are data from the U.S., but I guarantee you the same thing is happening in Canada. We just haven't published these data yet, is that wildfire smoke is starting to dominate people's lifetime exposure to air pollution because we've bought these other sources under control and we can't bring wildfire smoke under control and wildfire smoke is kind of getting worse and worse over time we're seeing the piece of the pie that's attributed to other sources of pollution shrink whereas the piece of the pie attributed to wildfire smoke is growing and that's very concerning from a public health perspective because we cannot regulate this exposure we need people to make individual behavioral changes to protect themselves whereas previously we've been able to protect everyone through those regulatory policy scale changes. Okay, let's see if I can do a little bit better on this poll. No, stop sharing. I need to relaunch this one. Can I do that? Relaunch, there we go. Aha. Wildfire smoke is a complex mixture of gases and fine particles. Which component of wildfire smoke is most relevant to human health? People taking a little bit of time to think about this one. Okay, I'm going to end this and share the results. Not surprising that fine particulate matter came out on top because that's the thing we talk about the most. Uh, I'm kind of in agreement with the we don't really know folks and we'll talk a little bit more about that here. Wildfire smoke is an incredibly complex mixture of stuff. Within that mixture, we regularly measure fine particulate matter and inorganic gases. Those are what we call the criteria pollutants. They are regulated across North America, so we have monitoring systems to track them. Partially, those monitoring systems exist because we know that those pollutants are harmful to human health and we've decided to track them to measure in part those public health harms. However, wildfire smoke comes with a whole bunch of other stuff that we do not routinely measure because it is very challenging to routinely measure. It takes much more sophisticated methods and because we're not making those measurements, we don't really know how those other components of wildfire smoke are affecting human health. However, we do know that fine particulate matter or particles less than 2.5 microns have a big impact on human health. So we can still use them as a reasonable proxy for the whole mixture, but we are still missing a lot of information about what people are exposed to. Now, I've got a few things here that I want to show you. First of all, we're talking about fine particles, less than 2.5 microns, these pink dots here in this hair. 
And here, we've blown them up a little bit to show what the particulate matter in wildfire smoke often looks like. It's actually these very, very tiny soot balls that clump together. And this is important because a particle like this has a very high surface area to volume ratio. There's a lot of opportunity for it to interact with the tissue in your lungs and respiratory system. And that may drive some of the health effects, the fact that these are actually made up of tiny particles. And then what happens with smoke is all this fresh smoke comes off the fire and then it gets transported in the atmosphere. It interacts with the sun, it interacts with other things in the atmosphere, and it ages over time. So that the smoke that New York gets exposed to can be vastly different from the smoke that got emitted from the fires in Quebec. And that aging really matters. We haven't figured out all the way it matters yet, but it does matter. The, the longer the smoke travels, it does appear that the more toxic it becomes because it um, has a much higher oxidative potential. And I just want you to sort of consider what's going on in this fire here. There's a whole bunch of different types of smoke that are being emitted. In this flaming area, there's going to be very hot fire, very complete combustion of the organic material. But in these smoldering areas, it's a much cooler fly fire and the material is not as completely combusted. Those things matter when it comes to the toxicity of the smoke. And then finally, more and more, we're seeing interface fires where it's not just wildland fuels that are burning, but whole communities are burning as well. So there's a lot of anthropogenic fuels that are contributing to the smoke. And that makes going to make a much more toxic, much more risky smoke as well. Very simply put, these fine particles can travel deep into the alveolar region of the lung, so the place where the lung exchanges oxygen with the blood. In that region, they cause inflammation, they cause irritation, and they cause oxidative stress. And when I said that that air pollution has a high oxidation potential, what it means is that it wants to steal oxygen from the body. And we know that oxidative stress or when there isn't enough oxygen available to the body can cause health effects. Also, these very small particles can translocate across the alveoli directly into the blood. And now they're circulating in the bloodstream and they have access to every organ system in the body. So this is a whole body effect, not just a lung effect. We know that the health effects of smoke start within hours of its arrival. These are data from my colleague and former PhD student, Dr. Angela Yao, and she looked at ambulance dispatches for a bunch of different health outcomes and smoke in the hours before the dispatch. Ambulance dispatches are great because we know exactly when it got dispatched and exactly where it got dispatched to, so we can do that really fine time resolution on the relationship between the exposure and the effect. And you don't need to understand all of this, but what she saw was that the largest effect on breathing problems and uh, paramedic assessed respiratory problems happened within the first hour of the smoke exposure. So we don't need to wait around in smoke for days for these effects to happen. They happen immediately. I want to walk you through what we see on a smoky day in British Columbia, where I'm going to define a smoky day as a 24-hour average PM 2.5 of 100 micrograms per meter cubed, which is not a super smoky day, but it's more than a moderately smoky day. On the left-hand side here, we have respiratory outcomes, and on the right-hand side here, we have cardiovascular outcomes. We're looking at dispensations of asthma puffers, physician visits for a wide range of respiratory outcomes and respiratory mortality. And what we see is almost across the board, almost a doubling of these types of respiratory indicators on smoky days. On the right-hand side with the cardiovascular, we do see that there's effects 
but this magnitude of the effect for the respiratory stuff is much smaller than there for the cardiovascular stuff is much smaller than the magnitude of the effect for the respiratory stuff. And then this is something that I call the public health paradox of wildfire smoke in that people start to pay a lot of attention to smoke when the air quality impacts are really bad. And here I'm going to call really bad over 100 micrograms per meter cubed. That's a very high risk category on the AQHI. But the reality is that the effects start right away. I already demonstrated that with the, the data from Dr. Yao. And we experience a lot more kind of moderate smoke impact days than severe smoke impact days. So that when we sum up all of the respiratory risks that we can attribute to wildfire smoke, only about 16% of them happen in the really bad category, and a large percentage of them happen at much lower concentrations. But if we're only talking about smoke when it gets really bad, we're really only going to make an impact on about 16% of the overall burden attributable to smoke. We really have to be encouraging everyone to protect themselves from smoke exposures whenever there is smoke affecting the air quality. I want to give you just a rapid summary here of the acute effects of wildfire smoke at the way it's the same as other types of air pollution and the way it's different so far in the literature. Overall, it seems to affect every organ system in the body the same way as air pollution from other sources. And generally, the magnitude of the PM2.5 effect for wildfire smoke is similar to the magnitude of the PM2.5 effect for PM2.5 from other sources. Generally, this is not exactly true, but overall, that's kind of how the literature is trending. What's different is that wildfire smoke has a much stronger acute respiratory effect for people, especially those people who have pre-existing respiratory conditions such as asthma, COPD, emphysema, fibrosis, any of those types of conditions where your lungs are, are not as good as other people's lungs on a day-to-day -day basis, wildfire smoke is going to be a hard hit. Now, next polling question. Back. Launch. Does wildfire smoke affect our health even after the smoke is cleared? Yes, no, or probably. Okay, so overall, the answer is yes, or probably nobody thinks no. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence. Oops. Stop sharing. There we go. There's a lot of evidence building in this field. That's where it's building, and generally speaking, the evidence certainly suggests that smoke has longer-lasting health effects. But I just want to sort of lay this out for you a little bit. These are data from Kelowna, or sorry, Kamloops in BC, and they're from the 2017 wildfire season, but they clearly show kind of not wildfire season, wildfire season, and not wildfire season. And there's always going to be health effects of smoke in this acute phase. But now what we're talking about is the chronic phase. What happens after the smoke goes away? And when we look at the annual average of PM 2.5 in this year, without the smoke, we see that it's 7 micrograms per meter cube. But with the smoke, it's 15 micrograms per meter cube, so almost doubled. The US EPA suggested that an annual change of 0.2 micrograms per meter cube is clinically relevant for the exposed population. So, you know, clear indication here that there is the opportunity for these exposures to really affect people's health in the long term. So far on the chronic effects, we know that smoke leads to persistent reductions in lung function, increased cardiovascular disease among wildland firefighters, cognitive impairment and dementia. You may have noted a big paper came out last week or, or was talked about last week on wildfire smoke and dementia. Subsequent severe events after the smoke occurs like uh, MI or out of hospital cardiac arrest 
mood and development disorders. That's not very surprising. Smoke and wildfires, very stressful for people. And then increasing evidence around lung, brain, and probably other cancers. All of this is perfectly consistent with what we know about air pollution from other sources. So what I say right now is in the absence of more specific evidence on wildfire smoke, we have absolutely no reason to believe that exposure to wildfire smoke carries less risk than exposure to any other type of air pollution. We should be leaning on the literature that we always already have available due to decades of research. Now, I want to highlight an area that is of particular concern with me, and that's when critical windows of human development intersect with very high smoke exposure. So I've had this study going for a few years now, looking at all infants who were in utero during the wildfire seasons of 2016 through 2019, and then looking at their health outcomes in early life. Because when we have this intersection of critical human development and very high air pollution, there is the opportunity for damage that is going to persist throughout the life course. So, holes. What factors make children more susceptible than adults to the health effects of air pollution? Higher respiratory rates, higher activity levels, more time outdoors, a rapid lung development, or all of the above. Yeah, so everybody went with all of the above on this one, and true. If I had to place a weighting on these different factors, I think number D, or letter D, is the one that I would go for. This idea that the, the lungs are growing very rapidly, both in utero and ex utero, um, and the fact that there's this opportunity for these exposures to disrupt that cellular development, that's really, I'm not a cellular biologist by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that's really critical when we're talking about the potential for health impacts that, that last for a long time. These are data from my PhD student, Emma Branch, working on this cohort and she was looking at prenatal exposure and birth outcomes with a focus on very severe birth outcomes such as stillbirth, extreme preterm birth, so this will be on the edge of viability, very preterm birth, and you know, they're sort of straight up preterm birth between 32 and 37 weeks gestation. The non-extreme wildfire seasons, the below average dots are red, and the extreme wildfire seasons are green. And what you can see is there's a small impact during the extreme wildfire seasons on preterm birth, a larger impact on very preterm birth, a much larger impact on extreme preterm birth, and a large impact on stillbirth. On the other hand, PM 2.5 during these non-wildfire season has really no impact on these outcomes. And then these are data from my PhD student, Jeanette Lynn. Uh, she's looking at prenatal exposure and respiratory infections by the age of one year, especially if infections that were treated with an antibiotic, because we know that we want to keep babies away from antibiotics in early life if we can. So these are the exposures of the mothers um, who were in the low wildfire seasons and the high wildfire seasons, you can see those clear differences. And then if we look at otitis media or inner ear infections with a very common infection in childhood, you can see very clear differences between these two groups in the red line and the blue line. And then when we look at that, I call that eyeball epidemiology, when you can just sort of see that there's a difference when we look at it more systematically based on periods of exposure during prenatal development, uh, we see that there's, you know, 
prenatal exposure during any time was associated with increased risk of infection and antibiotic treated infection. But it really is in these critical window three and four or second trimester where those exposures have the biggest impact. And second trimester is a period of very rapid go growth. So what do we do about all this? That's kind of the critical question here. And we will ask you, what's the best way to protect adults and children, including those in the womb from the effects of wildfire smoke, staying indoors, using indoor air cleaning strategies, wearing masks, reducing activity levels, monitoring air quality at home, or all of the above? you folks are on to me with all, all of the above answers. I'm going to have to maybe take that one out to make things a little more competitive in future. But yeah, it really is everything. The only way to protect yourself from wildfire smoke is a multi-pronged approach, again, based on individual level behavior change. So let's talk a little bit about these strategies. The way I have been talking to people about wildfire smoke is ask yourself the question, where are you breathing right now? And what are your opportunities to reduce your smoke exposure? What I don't want is everybody staying at home scared all summer. That's not a win from a public health perspective or an individual health perspective. I want people to feel empowered to go about living their lives with information and education so that they can take measures to reduce their exposures, but they're not maladapting by simply hiding at home in a room. So where are you breathing right now? And what are your opportunities to reduce your exposure? Most of us breathe most of our air at home, in our homes. And that's fantastic because we know that indoor air cleaning technology is very effective for reducing PM 2.5 exposures at home. What's not effective is just staying home with the doors and windows closed. We know that there can be almost complete infiltration of wildfire smoke into a home under those circumstances. We need to move on beyond that advice and say home with an air cleaner. And what we also know is that, you know, these commercial air cleaners work very well, but these do-it-yourself options also work really well. And the key differences between these are first price is going to be about $300. It's going to be about $50. And second, the ability to replace the filters on the technology. If this company stops making this air cleaner and it's proprietary filters, you have a $300 piece of junk. Here, you've got a box fan and a furnace filter, you're always going to be able to find another furnace filter. So honestly, I've really encouraged people to adopt these technologies and be wary of these technologies. When you're outside of your home, so certainly looking for cleaner air spaces in your community, that's a great place to spend time. If you're outdoors, take it easy. How much your air you're breathing matters. If you're resting, versus going for a hard run, there's about a 10 times difference in the amount of air that you're breathing in those two activities. And you're breathing it much more deeply if you're out for a run. So we certainly want people to continue to exercise, but really smoky days are times to think about exercising indoors in a cleaner environment at the gym, rather than going for a hard run outside. Use data. So this is the aqmap.ca. I spend a lot of my summer glued to this thing. It's a fantastic resource that pulls together the government data, all of the low cost sensor data across Canada. This is a capture from last night. It's going to tell you in real time what's going on with air quality in your community so you can make decisions about how you're going to spend time outdoors. And then this is a technology I have been talking about a lot recently. It's like we have low cost ability to measure air quality indoors. These things are sold by IKEA. The one on the left is 50 bucks. The one on the right is 15 bucks. We tested them in our lab. They work pretty good. Are they fantastic? No. Are they good enough to provide information about what's going on in your home? Absolutely. And these are just two examples of what's available out there. So to conclude, um, 
this is what I hear about wildfire smoke all the time. Lots of people are like, ah, it's natural. It's not a problem. It's like a campfire. Well, campfire smoke's not good for you either. And then there's like other people who are like, it's unsafe. It's dangerous. I don't think that's the right rhetoric. I don't think that's the right language to use when it comes to wildfire smoke. It is a form of air pollution that can affect your health. And the more you reduce your exposure, the more you do reduce your risk, both in the short term and the long term. And that's really how simple it is, is just coming back to, um, to this key message of reduce exposure, protect your health, reduce exposure, protect your health. Don't panic, but take it seriously. So I'm going to come back to this question that I asked at the beginning, which was about the 2023 wildfire season. I gave this presentation or a uh, uh, um, a version of this presentation with Mike Flanagan one day. And, you know, most people said that, yeah, they did expect there to be a more severe season in the next 10 years. And Mike was flabbergasted. He was like, I, I don't, I can't imagine there's going to be a more severe season in the next 10 years. But really, the answer here was always maybe. And for me to do my job properly and for everyone to approach wildfire season the way we need to approach it, we kind of have to imagine that every year is going to be the worst year we've ever seen, because that's the only sane way to do the planning and preparation. We need to be resilient to wildfire and smoke exposures. So thank you very much for your time. I think I've left some good time for questions and looking forward to further conversation. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation, Sarah. And if anyone does have questions uh, for Sarah, please feel free to leave them uh, in the chat box. I'm also just checking the Q&A box. We don't have any questions in there right now. That's great. It was perfectly clear. Maybe, uh, April, if you don't mind, uh, while we're waiting for questions to come in, Sarah or Dr. Henderson, if no, you please have call a... me Sarah, it's very confusing <laughs> for me when people call me Dr. Henderson. I hate it. Uh, fair enough. Uh, just wondering if you have any, and I, I, I've personally been a little bit overwhelmed trying to find an air purifier. Maybe, uh, the information you've given have given is enough, but is there any further tips on, uh, you know, you had indicated it doesn't matter the brand, doesn't matter, there's, but there's certain key things if you could just maybe uh, remind us of those. Thank sure. You. So this, the key thing that you're looking for is the clean air delivery rate or the CADR, C-A-D-R. And any commercially available air cleaner should have the CADR printed on the box. If you do not see that printed on the box, do not buy that air cleaner. And typically, you want to ensure that the catter is good for the space that you're using, that you want to clean. And then I've seen professionals say, and then multiply by three. Like, if you really want to ensure that you can clean your space and you can clean your space on the lowest setting of the air cleaner, go for a bigger CADR. Because... Air cleaners are noisy, and the higher rate that they're running at, the noisier they are, and the less likely you are to use them. So buy one that you can use on the low setting so that it doesn't annoy you and it doesn't you don't turn it off, because if you turn it off, it's not doing anything for you. So I think that's really good practical advice. Now, when we're talking about the low-cost do-it-yourself solutions, in general, the catter increases with the number of filters that you use on the fan. So you'll you'll you probably heard of a Corsi Rosenthal box, which is a fan on the top and then four filters along the bottom. That has the highest catter. And I'll I'll make a bit of a plug for a resource that we have at the NCCH, which kind of compared do-it-yourself devices with commercial devices. And there is a bit of a, a CADR translation table in that. And I'll, I'll put a link in here when I have a moment to go pull the, the information up. So that's kind of the number one piece of information that you need. But that second piece around the proprietary filters is huge. 
I can't tell you how many people I've talked to of like, oh, the company went out of business or they don't make this model anymore. And now this thing is useless. And that is so frustrating. It's so annoying. So I would also be looking for companies that have been in, you know, in business for a long time that have consistently made a model or that they use a type of filter that's uh, interchangeable across models. I suggest like if you're shopping online, go to the reviews and then search the reviews for wildfire smoke and see what people are saying about that device for wildfire smoke. Um, you know, talk to the company if you need to, but, you know, really like be looking to those companies that have been established in this space for a long time so that they're not fly by night and you're not going to get left with a chunk of junk. Great. Thank you. And I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in now. And let's see, the first one, um, Peter asks, where are there plans for these homemade filters and what do we search for an air quality meter? The plans for the filters you can find in lots of different places. I'm just going to link to that NCCH resource right now. And I think we we cover all of the different types of filters and we have pictures of how you can build them. Um, so it uh, ranges from as simple as uh, taping a filter to the back of a box fan. And then there's these different configurations. There's one configuration where there's two box fans, one at either end of the situation and three in the middle. So please take a look at that resource and that'll give you some ideas. There's also lots of videos online. What to look for in an indoor monitoring is a good question. So I don't like to, um, you know, endorse any specific company. But I will say that the IKEA monitors have been tested by quite a few people like me and other scientists who were interested in them. They came on the market early and people were like, oh, do these things work? And all of that testing suggests, yeah, they work pretty well. They're not fantastic, but they're good enough. Um, so really, I'd be looking online to see if you can find any evidence that any scientists have done any work with those devices or published, you know, in blogs or anything, what they think about the device. Um, and I can say that there's been enough work with the IKEA devices from trusted scientists that I, I don't mind saying it's not a bad option. Great, I'll be going to my local IKEA right after this uh, presentation for sure. Um, Let's see, Diana asks, from a workplace perspective and workers in locations with higher levels of wildfire smoke exposure, do you have any suggestions for precautions other than indoor air filters and N95 respirators? This is a tough one. You know, a lot of people do have to work outside all day. And in many cases, those people are potentially highly marginalized, especially when we're talking about agriculture and migrant workers. Um, it's tough. So certainly we have to be looking to our occupational health and safety organizations to be providing leadership in this space around how we should be thinking about smoke exposures for these workers. A lot of that work has been done in the U.S. There's been some pretty stringent policies brought in in Washington State and in California. Oregon's working on that as well. Um, we haven't seen that yet in Canada. Uh, it would be great if we if we did start to see it. But uh, respiratory protection, when it is possible to wear it and use it, and the proper respiratory protection for the situation. And then thinking about times where maybe work needs to be stopped or moved to different times of day when smoke is less around. You know, there is sort of a diurnal pattern to smoke exposures just because the meteorology drives the exposures at night. We do seem to see that the atmosphere damps down a bit and traps smoke close to the earth. And then as it heats up during the day, that smoke is able to kind of get out of the lower uh, surface part of the atmosphere. So, you know, just thinking through intelligently when exposures are highest and when they're lowest and starting to to maybe plan work a little bit around those cycles. Great, and I think our last question for the day is, you mentioned that wildfires has become a season. Would you say that this occurs more frequently than annual? Not quite sure I understand that question, sorry. Is it written here in the chat? 
It is. If you just scroll up a little bit, I think they're wondering if it happens more. Oh, than- does wildfire happen all year around? Uh, yeah and no. So you know what we're seeing in Canada is previously we would have defined the wildfire season as sort of May, June, July, August into September. Now it's more like April, May, June, July, August, September, October. And then what we saw last year, especially in northern parts of the West, was these holdover fires. They're burning in sort of peaty, boggy areas, and the the fire doesn't actually get entirely out. It burns all through the winter, and then it might flare up again in the spring. Um, So, you know, fires can burn at any time of year in Canada, but we're still going to see the most constant concentrated activity in the hottest driest seasons of the year but the the thing is that the the summer is kind of getting hotter and drier and i think you know estimates are that the wildfire season is now kind of technically 30 to 45 days longer than it used to be i think that might be it for our questions for today maria did you have any last comments before we wrapped up no i guess i just want to thank uh sarah and, and april for this opportunity it's always great to learn more um and, and hear some things again but uh yeah no, i really appreciate all the practical tips uh, sarah that you've given us here today and uh and april the opportunity to link uh, red cross and fire smart canada together it's great i look forward to future work with you so thanks everyone for coming and i'll pass it back to you april Thank you so much, Maria. And Maria and Sarah, this has been such a wonderful learning opportunity for us as well and for our CRC audience. And uh, our recording will be available uh, on our YouTube channel in about a week. And we'll be sending the recording to all registrants. Um, And besides that, uh, this has been so great to have you both here. And thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you for having me. And uh, let's hope that you don't have to deal with too much smoke for the rest of the summer. But hopefully if you do, you're a little more prepared than you were an hour ago. (laughs) Take care, everybody. Take care. Thank you.